boat isn't they? The greater effect is that 60% that they're not with us. Yeah. And it comes back to that idea. And I, when I did that math, I was in shock. Yeah. I, I just, I, 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 I re-upped my theory on, on recruiting and the importance of it. You know, looking at recruiting in a whole different way where not only do I want to talk to that high school rowing coach, I want to talk to the, to the basketball coach that worked with them in eighth grade. I want to the, talk to the guidance counselor. I want to talk to the parent. So I know exactly what I'm, I'm getting yeah. and, um, and if it's the right fit for what we're looking to do. Right. And, and I love hearing that too, because, you know, I will say one thing is that through my experience as a youth coach and seeing dozens and dozens of athletes recruited, it is staggering how terrible college recruiters are. Yeah. You know, and, and clearly that's not a universal statement. There's some wonderful ones out there. You know, Laura being one in particular and the reason I asked her to be the first guest on the podcast. Yeah, she's one of the best. Yeah, and, and, you know, I wouldn't have been sitting down with you if you weren't a, a talented recruiter, but it's just seeing, you know, that, that skill is just not there. And, and we talked about this, I think, a little bit with Laura and, and just recognizing the fact that you know, also tying into what you said earlier that there's there's only a limited amount of coaches that people can bring into the program. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of times your focus is on well let's bring in the, we need to bring in the best coach and, and we have recruiting that needs to be done and we're gonna sign up to somebody and that might not be somebody who's a recruiter. Yeah. But um, you know, maybe there's you know, hearing you talk about, you know, and if you wanna expand on it a little bit more of the ways you look at it, but the ways and the strategies that you use to recruit and the things that are necessary to ensure that you're getting good people, not only great athletes, but the right fit for your culture, for the academic setting that you're in, you know, for the competitive goals that you have for the program and, and the time and the work that you put into that. Because, I mean, I've had, I've had athletes get recruited that were offered you know, over $100,000 worth of scholarship money yeah. where the, the coach never called me yeah. you know, and, and didn't make any phone calls to guidance counselors or other people. And, and it's because there was a, a good ERG score, yeah. you know, and, uh, and maybe they had good, you know, charisma in that, in that conversation and, and very simple things that could have been revealed in that time to show that that was not the right fit for that program. Yeah. And, and other ones that recruited great athletes, you know, you recruited, one of my best athletes, Elise, yeah. um, who was a wonderful athlete, but her her scores were at the top yeah. of the time. But she and she was, had been she a phenomenal it. athlete for me at yeah. GW. And did, captain, I believe. Yeah, she was, she was uh, fantastic. And your work was able to identify that she was on. She, one, she had the personality, and she had, she was on the trajectory. Yeah. You know of improvement, whereas you know I've seen other athletes that were on the opposite trajectory. You know they had peaked, but right. you know and they were on the decline cause, either because they were burned out or because you know for other personal reasons. You know the other 22 hours in the day that yeah. they weren't uh, committing in the way they needed to. Um, so yeah, so if you can uh, kind of let you off the leash there and talk yeah. a little bit about that process and, and what is it that you're doing, what is it, what are the conversations that you're having, who are you calling you yeah. to find out this is the athlete I want to invest in? I, I think this is one of the things that I, I enjoy most about my job. It's, it's one of the few uh, careers, I think, that you, uh, you know, me as, as, as the head coach, I have total autonomy over my happiness, yeah. right? In this boathouse, uh, I'm, I'm controlling uh, the, the people that are coming in the front door. Every, every person that's coming in this house, we have control over. Yeah. And I think we sometimes forget that as a recruiter and we get caught up, and I've made the mistake, we get caught up with numbers or, or height or where they row, and we forget to look at the, the real person. And so for me, it's got to be, be about outworking the other schools. And so that means I'm getting on the horn, horn right now. All of our top 40 kids that we're talking to, I'm the first phone call that, that they get. Yeah. It's from me every single night, as much as my, my wife may not like it, uh, from 8.30 till 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, I'm on the phone Monday through Thursday. And so it's, it's, um, it's really important that they hear directly from, from me, the tip of the spear of what I'm doing, what my vision is, who I am. And for me, it's, it's yes, the early scores are important. Yeah. But that's just one piece. I want to know the personality, right? I want to know if they can talk with me and carry on a good conversation. I want to know if, if I feel like they're reading a list of questions like a robot. What is your culture like, you know, to me? Or are they actually engaging, yeah. right? The ones that are engaging, 99% of the time, those are the ones that are coming out in my boathouse and I'm going to enjoy working with and in turn, they're also going to enjoy working with me. And so getting on the phone with them, kind of getting through 
um, that loophole first, right? Do they pass the test for me? And, and do I pass the test for them making that connection? But it really is, um, we're looking at athletes that, like Elise, may not have been flying, but you set yourself, she had the right personality. And, and for me, that, that goes a, a really long way in the process is, is, is their body language, their attitude, their, their pedigree, what kind of family do they come from? So I'm always asking, you know, what do your parents do? What was that, what was home like? Yeah. Was your dad a taxi basically driving you to softball, to track practice, to tennis, or were you sitting at home not doing sports much in your life? And that's gonna, to me, indicate what are they gonna do the other 60% of the time yeah. when I'm not influencing them. That's true, yeah. And they're, and they're at their home being influenced by their parents. Mm -hmm. And so these are things that through GW, I made some some recruiting errors, and I kind of missed some 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 warning signs. And I, I, I still look. We all make mistakes at times, but we tr we work really hard here at UMass to try to do our background. So they'll get through the loophole of the conversation with me, and then I pass them to each one of my other three assistants, and they have a phone call with all four. So once they get through all four, they've kind of run the gauntlet. If they're green lighted through that then we, we consider them a, rec a recruit that we're actively pursuing. Um, so. And I'm curious going back, and, and certainly no names involved, yeah, sure. but look, you, know, you mentioned the errors that you make yeah. in recruitment, and, and I was having a similar conversation with Steve, you know, and he was saying the same thing. We don't get it right all the time. No. What, can you go back and say, these are the errors I made with these athletes? Was it a universe? Was it just something that was particular to the athlete? Or were there just things that you learned along the way that other people could benefit from of like, okay, well don't do this. You know, this led to this bad decision with this athlete. You look at some of the, the what I think are some of the, the recruiting errors, captivated with a, a, an ERG number, mm. right? Something they've done on the ERG that's, that's fascinating. Uh, it, it just, it, it stands on paper. It's something that you know, in my younger days, I couldn't resist it. But for me now, I'm so much more uh, into athleticism yeah. over, over ERG scores. You know, you look at our recruited class that we just brought in, all, seven out of the nine of them are multi-sport athletes. And for me, those are the ones that are going to have a, a lasting power um, because they don't only know rowing. They've been, right. you know, athletes first, rowers second. They're but competitors. Competitors. It's, you know, uh, we used to call them gym rats. Gotcha. You know, people that just, that's what they know. You know, their default is to get a workout in. Mm -hmm. and, and so those are the ones that have, that have done really well for me. You know, I think captivated by ERGs, by, by programs that they were a part of, mm -hmm. um, for some high school kids, their high school career is kind of their their peak, yeah. and nothing ever will be as good. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a, a pitfall that that we can fall into a little bit. And you're kind of always they're always searching, you know, back in band camp, yeah. you know, kind of that philosophy. Uh, and so I think that's something you have to watch. I, I like thirsty athletes. You know, I talk. I was just talking to a recruit the other night that that you know she she's she's playing basketball right now. And she only rows in the spring, and she loves rowing, and she probably wants to row in college. But like, she's gonna be really thirsty. Yeah. You know, when she gets to to us, you know, ideally she's not as dinged up. She's worked some different body uh, mechanics, her lateral movement, her agility, her jumping stuff that if you've been rowing all throughout high school, yeah. which sometimes can be a pitfall. Right. You know, those those athletes that have rowed and have logged a lot of miles, and their bodies are a little bit dinged up. That that can be a little bit of a risky move. Not all the time, because I've had athletes that have been in programs with huge volume yeah. and have gone on to the next level. But it's hard to pinpoint, and I think that's why it's, it's, it's hard for me to sit here and say, like, I'll never make a mistake again. Right. But we work really hard to do our homework. I love asking the question, two questions I love. What would coach say about you? Mm -hmm. If I was to call coach up right now, what would they say about you? And I also love asking um, what they did this past summer before they arrived at school. Because I'm very curious, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I, I didn't have time to work, I didn't have time to work out because I was, I was working at camp. Yeah. You know, what I love is hearing the kids that are like, yeah, I went and I, I, uh, I rode from five to seven and then I landscaped all day or uh, yeah, I worked at a, uh, at a gym all day yeah. and then I lifted some weights in the afternoon. So I always love catching them off guard and going, what did you do this past summer? Because yeah. to me, that's really indicative of who they are. They're probably not going to change that much. Like who they are in high school, as far as their their training ethic, 
I probably won't change them as much. And that's another mistake I think I've made in the past is, is thinking, I'll change that kid. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make them better. Yeah. Um, they're showing flashes, I'll make, like, look, where they are, where they come in, I think there's a strong trajectory, not only over the four years that they're with us, but each year. And so their arrival fitness, you know, for us, it's, we started September 9th, to me is, in, is, is a, has a direct correlation to where I'm gonna be able to get them on May 18th for the A-10 championships. Well, you gotta expect that. If you're looking at the slope of their improvement, yeah. that slope is, they're all doing mostly the same work. Exactly. Right? And so if you're starting Except to slope from a higher point, you know, it's the same with aerobic fitness. You know, if you have a higher aerobic base, then once you add your anaerobic, you know, capacity to that, you're going to perform at a higher level. And if you have a lower aerobic base, then you, you can't change the degree of your anaerobic capacity. You know, nope. that's fixed by human physiology. So what you're going to change is the aerobic base. And so I say, like, it's, it's like if you got to reach up and you got to change a light bulb, right? And that light bulb is, is you have the 2K that you want to achieve, right? You know, you are limited in your, your anaerobic capacity is your body, right? And so you can stand on you can stand on your tippy toes and stretch and if you've got a little bit more limber you maybe get a little bit more stretch, but you're not gonna get a whole lot extra by doing more anaerobic work. Yep. But if you want to reach that light bulb, just get a stool, right? You know, but let's say you have to build that stool with, with tiny Legos and every Lego is an aerobic, you know, steady state session. Yep. And so it's like you gotta you gotta put in I like a lot that of aerobic. I yeah. like Legos, but I like that analogy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I say Legos just because they're small, right? Yeah, it yeah. takes so much aerobic you know, time to, to build that up.